Okay, well, thank you for being willing to uh, record this video here. Can you maybe uh, let's just let us know a little bit about uh, who you are and what your position is? Sure. Hi, everybody. My name is Rabbi Joshua Berman. I'm a professor of Hebrew Bible at Bar Ilan University in Israel, uh, where I've lived for 33 years. I'm originally from uh, the New York area. Uh, I made Aliyah, which means I moved to Israel right after I graduated from Princeton. And uh, I've had the opportunity to meet uh, Thomas and Heather here on the banks of the Nile. All right, great, thank you. Can you tell us a little bit about what a suzerain vassal treaty is, for example? Right, okay. So, um, what scholars have noticed is that uh, the way in which the, the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses, discuss the relationship between the Almighty and Israel through the commandments, through various rituals that the, uh, that, the, that the Pentateuch describes, what we can see is striking similarities to a certain type of political arrangement that existed around the time of a traditional dating of the Exodus from Egypt, uh, a type of political arrangement called a vassal treaty. And what that means is that there used to be a situation where you'd have, let's say, a king of a small city-state who would be in trouble. It could be that there was a siege on his city-state. It could be that there was a famine in his city-state. And he would send out an SOS to a, a stronger, more superior king uh, and say, you know, hey, come help me out. And the stronger king would do that. And not out of the goodness of his heart, because in politics there is no goodness of the heart, but out of a sense that, hey, if I help out that little guy, we can become partners. I'll be the senior partner, or the suzerainty, the sovereign king, and he'll be the lexer partner, but we'll be partners, the vassal king. And what they would do typically is that it was understood that if the sovereign king gave deliverance to the weaker, smaller king, then it was incumbent upon the weaker king to now enter into this arrangement. And what we've discovered, what scholars have discovered, is that there was kind of a set kind of contract that would be written up between the sovereign, the stronger king, and the vassal, the weaker king. And that the, 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 the structure of this type of contract or treaty is exactly what we find in the Pentateuch. It would always contain this, this, this contract, this vassal treaty, contained the following set elements. There would be an historical prologue that would tell the story of how it is that the weaker king, the vassal, came to take upon himself the status of a vassal, a lesser partner, to the sovereign or stronger king. Following that historical prologue, there were then the stipulations. What is it that the vassal needs to do uh, on behalf of the stronger king, send troops, pay taxes, etc. Uh, and what are the responsibilities of the stronger king, the sovereign, for the vassal? Does he have to provide protection? Under what circumstances? Uh, the next st set part of this contract could be uh, witnesses to the contract. That could be heavenly beings, various gods, <clears throat> blessings and curses. And there could be some other things as well. Now, what scholars have noticed is that this seems to fit very well for what we find in the, in the Pentateuch. That is, Israel cries out to the Lord in Exodus 3 and says, save us. And along comes the Lord and saves them. Well, now that means that Israel needs to become a vassal to the Almighty. And so at Sinai, right soon, right after the Exodus, Israel enters into a treaty, right? The treaty, or, or, or yeah, yeah, a treaty. Um, and what that happens at Sinai, and at Sinai, that's where Israel gets all of their stipulations, or what we call today commandments. These are the obligations upon the vassal. And also, the Torah, the Pentateuch, tells us what does the Lord commit to Israel? What does the sovereign king commit to Israel? Uh, one of the things that the vassal treaties would discuss is um, uh, that, the, that the, the, the vassal has to take the treaty tablets and put it into his own temple. Well, this is what Israel does. They take the treaty tablets, the tablets that Moses brings down the second time after he smashed the first ones, and he deposits them into the temple. 
And then after we have all of these stipulations, what each side owes each other, you have witnesses at the end of Leviticus, uh, or, or specifically blessings and, blessings and curses in Leviticus 26. So what we have here is a kind of uh, arrangement, and, and that's, that's what the Vassal Treaty tells us. So where do we see this kind of suzerain vassal treaty format in the Pentateuch? You kind of touched on that already, but can you explain a little bit more where we actually see this in the books of Moses? Right, okay, so when the Torah, when the Pentateuch uses the word berit, which means treaty or covenant, then it's, it's really talking, this is what it's talking about. Uh, but we can see that the, the dynamics are very, are very, very similar. So for example, in these, in these uh, suzerainty treaties, uh, the vassal would be told, addressed by the sovereign, you must come and, 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 and see my face. That's, that's the literal expression that's used, which means you have to pay a court visit. And then we see in the Pentateuch that three times it says uh, that, that thrice annually, Israelite men must come and see the face of the Lord. Well, that's what they're doing. They're, may, they're paying homage as a visit to the court of the, of the, of the, of the, of the sovereign Lord. Okay, sure, thank you. And how does the suzerain vassal treaty format and its appearance in uh, the Pentateuch relate to the issue of uh, the dating of the Pentateuch and whether Moses wrote it or not? Okay, so here we go. This set form of the, of the, uh, the suzerainty treaty existed in what's called the Late Bronze Age. This would be roughly 1500 to 1200 BCE. And then after about 1200 BCE, what we discover is that no, no nation in, in, the, uh, in the ancient Near East, in this part of the world, what we call the Levant, uh, no, no, these simply ceased to be written anymore because this, these were part of a particular culture that all fell apart. All the big empires in, uh, in, in this part of the world fell apart around the year 1200 for various reasons. So this means that if you see that the Pentateuch is invoking, is borrowing, is appropriating a certain paradigm that has its origins in the politics of the time, well, how does that happen if the, if the Pentateuch is written, you know, in the 6th century, the 7th century, the 5th century? How would they have known about this paradigm, to quote it? And so this is what suggests that, these, that, these, that the, 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 the accounts and the structure of the Pentateuch itself uh, have their origins really in that in that time, which would fit a traditional dating in Jewish and Christian sources uh, for for the Exodus from Egypt. Sure, and would if the Pentateuch is written by Moses, he would of course have been a uh, very knowledgeable being in the Egyptian court. Would even in the times of Moses, a peasant or somebody just making something up have been especially aware of these things, or would you have to have been somebody basically like Moses to have known about this? Yeah, so, you know, I mean, treaties are the stuff of, of, of leaders, um, so Moses would have known it. It is likely, I think, that, you know, a lot of simple folk, uh, Israelites at the time, may not have understood this, but they understood, you know, God is, is a king, and kings make demands of their subjects, and so every people, every person understood on their on their own level. Um, yeah, one of the really interesting things about I'll just say this parenthetically is that the first instance that we find in the Pentateuch of reading and writing is Moses in Exodus 17, when God says, "Write this down after the battle with the Amalekites, and put it in the and put it in the in, and put it in the ears of Joshua, my own first name." Moses was a prince of Egypt. And we know the Egyptian princes got an education in how to read and write. So you would say that the uh, presence of the suzerain vassal treaty format in the Pentateuch would be strong uh, corroboration for Moses having written uh, those documents like the text itself says. Yeah, I don't see how you can get the structure of the text that we have with the, the many, there's really more than a dozen links to these uh, 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 suzerainty treaties. I've only touched upon a few of them here. I don't know how you get to that without saying that the origins of all this is, is in that time period. Okay, well, thank you very much for sharing. I appreciate your taking your time. Okay. Approximately 100 treaties and law codes have been discovered and translated of comparative value to the Sinai Covenant the Bible declares that God gave to Moses. The covenants from the 3rd millennium BC, 
differ in structure from those of the second, and those of the second differ in structure from those of the first. Exodus 20 through 24 and Deuteronomy are written in a covenant structure employed in the second half of the second millennium BC, that is, the biblical time of Moses. This structure, known as the Suzerain Vassal Treaty, was consciously followed in both Exodus and Deuteronomy. Treaties from a thousand years later, when skeptics must date the Pentateuch if they wish to explain away its predictive prophecies, are radically different in format from those of the time of Moses, in which the Sinai Covenant was composed. The biblical text shares intimate distinctions with the late second millennium documents not found in the first millennium. Thus, without any doubt, the book of Deuteronomy belongs to the classic stage in this documentary evolution, the second millennium BC. Here, then, is significant confirmation of the case for the Mosaic origin of the Deuteronomic Treaty of the Great King. The form-critical data compel the recognition of the antiquity not merely of this or that element within Deuteronomy, but of the Deuteronomic Treaty in its integrity. Indeed, the literary structure of the Pentateuch not only supports its ancient origin, but it very strongly supports its mosaic authorship. The testimony of Dr. Kenneth Kitchen is highly noteworthy. Dr. Kitchen is considered in Egyptological circles as the leading expert for the period of Egyptian history during which Israel's exodus took place. Furthermore, in conjunction with Paul Lawrence, Dr. Kitchen has transcribed and translated every known law code and treaty text from the 3rd through the 1st millenniums BC, be they Sumerian, Eblite, Akkadian, Hittite, Egyptian, Hebrew, or Aramaean, in his magisterial three-volume magnum opus, Treaty, Law, and Covenant in the Ancient Near East. Concerning the historicity of the books of Moses and the Exodus, Dr. Kitchen notes, The particular and special form of covenant evidenced by Exodus Leviticus and Deuteronomy, and mirrored in Joshua 24, could not possibly have been reinvented even in the 14th or 13th centuries by a runaway rabble of brick-making slaves under some uncouth leader no more educated than themselves. The formal agreeing, formatting, and issuing of treaty documents belongs to governments and, in antiquity, to royal courts. Private citizens had no part in, and no first-hand knowledge of, such arcane diplomatic procedures. Their only role was to hear the content of a treaty, if they were vassals of a suzerain overlord, and obey it through their own ruler. So also today, treaties are agreed to by heads of state, and implemented by them, and any bills are picked up by the long-suffering taxpayers with never a sight of the original interstate document responsible for the cost. So, how come documents such as Exodus Leviticus and Deuteronomy just happen to embody very closely the framework and order and much of the nature of the contents of such treaties and law collections established by kings and their scribal staffs at court in their respective capital cities in the late second millennium. This is socially and conceptually a million miles away from serfs struggling to build Pyramses and Pithom in the sweaty earthy brick fields of Exodus 1, 11 to 14 and 5, 6 through 20. No Hebrew there could know of, or would care about, such high-level diplomatic abstractions. Even a runaway rabble inevitably needs a leader. To exploit such concepts and formats for his people's use at that time, the Hebrew's leader would necessarily have had to have been in a position to know of such documents at first hand, either because he knew people who shared such information with him, or because he was himself involved with such documents there is no other option. In short, to explain what exists in our Hebrew documents, we need a Hebrew leader who had experience of life at the Egyptian court, mainly at the, in the East Delta, hence at Pyramses, including knowledge of treaty-type documents in their format, as well as of traditional Semitic legal and social usage more familiar to his own folk. In other words, somebody distressingly like that old hero of biblical tradition, Moses, is badly needed at this point to make any sense of the situation as we have it, or somebody in his position of the same or another name. 
on the basis of the series of features in Exodus 2 Deuteronomy that belong to the late second millennium and not later, there is again no other viable option. The suzerain vassal treaty format found in the Pentateuch provides strong confirmation of the Mosaic authorship of the Pentateuch. This is significant because the Pentateuch contains clear and specific predictive prophecies that were fulfilled many hundreds of years after Moses lived. For example, Deuteronomy 4 and 28 predict, 1. Israel would be removed from Canaan on account of her sins. 2. This exile would take place a long time after her entry into the land. 3. Israel would be scattered among the heathen nations when she is exiled. 4. Although God had set up a republic in Israel, the nation would have rejected republican government for monarchy at the time when the exile takes place. 5. The Israeli population would be greatly reduced through the trials of the exile. 6. The nation bringing about the exile would have a language unintelligible to Israel. 7. The nation causing the exile would have armies that are very fast moving. 8. The exile would take place through the agency of a nation that Israel was not familiar with, and thus, for example, Israel would not be exiled into Egypt, where Israel had been living years before at the time of Moses. 9. The exile would move Israel to a nation which was far away from Canaan, and thus would not be into a nearby nation such as Edom or Moab, and so on. 10. Some of the Israelis would be brought into Egypt in ships to be sold as slaves, but nobody would buy them. 11. The Israelis would not have peace in the land of their exile, but would remain as a distinct people group and receive continuing persecution. These predictions were partially fulfilled in the Babylonian captivity, which Israel suffered in the 6th century BC, and completely fulfilled in the Roman captivity Israel suffered after AD 70. The evidence for the Mosaic authorship of the Pentateuch from the suzerain vassal treaty format, among many other compelling lines of evidence, makes it impossible for someone who is intellectually honest to successfully claim that these prophecies were only recorded after the fact. Only the Bible has clear and specific predictive prophecies, because the Bible is the word of the God who is sovereign over all time and history. Mere men and imaginary false gods cannot infallibly prophesy, but the Creator can, who testified, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Isaiah 46, verses 9 and 10.